Mike waited for the door to close. He listened to Max's footsteps across, tap across the concrete porch. As soon as he was sure she was gone, he clenched his fist and squeezed his eyes closed so hard that his entire body trembled. Mike clamped his mouth closed too. If he hadn't, he was sure he would scream. A wail of despair and frustration and fury was clenching in his chest, and it took everything he had not to let it out. With a roar, weeping up his fro like a lion finally freed from a cage, gasping at the disciplinary notice, Mike fought about his aunt's message, or else. Mike knew what was that. Damn his Aunt Jane. When was she going to back off? Mike shook his head. Never, he said out loud. Taking a deep breath, he shoved aside the thoughts of his aunt. Smelling the lasagna sauce and cheese, he thought about eating, but the idea immediately brought a wave of nausea. Mike stood up and looked at the half-eaten pan of lasagna. It was cold, and the cheese was starting to concrete. He was tempted to dump it in the trash, but maybe if he warmed it up, he could get Abby to eat it. Now holding his breath but figuring he could try to feed his sister, Mike put the lasagna in the little microwave next to the stove. He pressed a couple buttons and turned the head towards Abby's room. As Mike rotated, he saw the delinquency note. His rage and frustration combustion, he grabbed it, balled it up, and flung it into the plastic bin under the kitchen sink. Then he kicked the bin, slammed the cabinet door, and looked up at the, dirt, look up at the dirty white ceiling. Three feet above Mike's head, a spider was scrolling away at a long straight of webs. The webbing was attached to a half-complete web that stretched from a grumpy glass ceiling right to the corner of the room. Go, Mike said to the spider. He hoped that thing had better luck at getting his home in order than Mike was having. Mikey loved, I mean, Abby loved her Heidi tent, but she also loved her desk. Too bad she couldn't fit her desk inside her Heidi tent. Drawing was much easier at her desk. Toying with the shoulder strap of her favorite red overalls, Ma Abby looked at the array of colored pencils spayed out next to the drawing pad. Which green would be better for the big tree? Deciding, Abby picked up the darkest green pencil and began carefully sketching in the fluffy edges of the tall palm tree branches. The spat orange metal lamp that sat on her desk stoned down like a tree like sunshine, making a yellow sun Abby had already drawn above the tree even brighter looking. The golden wharf of the desk lamp made Abby's animal friends and her and the black haired man and black haired little girl under the tree look even happier than Abby wanted them to look. Even as Abby bent over the task of creating dozens of little green pine needles on the tree, she glanced at the creatures she drew, and the man and girl. She managed to look like they were playing Ring Around the Rosie, and she wasn't sure she pulled that off, but the big curved smile she put on their faces made it clear that they were playing having a good time. For a second, Abby's pencil stopped moving as her feelings pushed past her concentration on the feeling. If only the drawing could come true, Abby wished Mike would play with her sometimes. He used to, but lately... Behind Abby, her bedroom door squeaked. She glanced over her shoulder as Mike stepped into the room. Mike lifted a hand in greeting, and Abby returned the gesture. Then she swiveled back around and bent closer to her drawing. She went back to sketching the green pine needles. What you drawing? Mike said, asked as he shuffled steps across her carpet. Trees? Abby said simply. She looked up when Mike stopped beside her white desk chair. The desk chair was what they call a ladder back chair. Mike had told her that. He didn't like it as much as the desk. It was hard to m and made her back hurt if she sat on it for too long. That was why when sometimes she drew on her tent, even though the drawing she did have was never that as good. Mike's arm slipped past Abby's shoulder. He tapped the man in the drawing. This is a good looking dude I recognize. He, Mike said. He moved his finger in one of Abby's friends. Who are these punks? Abby kept working on the tree. My friends, she said. It's not done yet. Mike saw, sighed loud in Abby's ear. She ignored his unspoken criticism. She knew how he felt about her friends. The four creaked as Mike took a step back away from Abby's chair. You can finish later, he said. The word sounded sad. It's time to eat. Abby sat down the green pencil and picked up a yellow one to add a little more detail on one of her friends. Not hungry, she said. Mike let out another sigh. Abby didn't feel this one, but it was louder. Don't care, Mike said. You need to eat. Let's go. The four creak again, and Mike's hands closed around Abby's upper arm. She attempted to pull her away from the chair. No! Abby shrieked as she dropped her pencil and swirled to her face her brother. The words came out like a siren from her mouth. The one small sounding rising and lowering in pitch and volume. Abby twisted her arm to shake off Mike's hand. As soon as Abby pulled away from Mike, 
He let go of her. Abby rubbed her arm. It didn't really hurt. Mike had held her firmly, but he hadn't been rough. He was never rough. Sighing in the third time, Mike backed away from Abby and sat down on the edge of the bed. She sat in her chair and watched him. The thin mattress sat under his weight and the box spring loud squeak. Mike rubbed his palm over his hand and then he looked at Abby as if he was about to beg her for a favor. Abs, he said, his voice really soft. The day I'm having... Mike swallowed and shook his head. Just please come and eat some food, please. Abby looked at her brother. She thought he looked paled. And the little lines of the outside corners of his eyes that were bunched up tired than usual. She shifted her gaze to the mattress. You're sitting on my friend, Abby said. Mike snorted and stood. You know what? Do whatever you want. Do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. Mike started stomping towards the door, but then he stopped. He spoke again with his back to Abby, but you know, you should know what happens to little girls who don't eat their dinners. Mike rotated towards Abby in a super slow motion. He squinted at Abby and scrunched his face into what Abby thought was supposed to be a mean look, like he was trying to be one of the bad guys in a cartoon. Abby didn't like feel like playing along with Mike's stupid game, so she stayed silent. She looked at him carefully to keep her face totally blank. When kids don't eat, Mike said, leaning forward, their bodies stay the same size forever. Abby shrugged and rolled her eyes. Mike wagged a finger at her, and that means that they die without ever getting to ride the adults' rides at the amusement park. Abby almost smiled at that, but Mike didn't deserve a smile. Abby looked away from Mike, back to the now empty bed. She studied the spot where Mike had sat. My friend says you're an idiot, Abby told Mike, glancing towards him. Mike's face went rigid. A vein of the edge of his forehead got bigger and looked like it was hopping up and down at his skin. Abby thought she could hear his teeth grind as he turned around and head towards the door. Just shy of the door, Mike stopped. He looked back at Abby. At least I'm real, he said. His voice was harsh and unfriendly. Mike strode out the room and slammed the door behind him. The kaplum took a couple seconds to fade away. The yucky feeling Mike left behind lingered for a long than, than that. Abby looked over the bed. He doesn't mean it, he said. He has stress. From beyond the door, Mike's bellow was muffled and distant. No, I don't, he shouted. Mike dropped onto the edge of his turned-down bed. He sat down so hard that the bed's wound slender headboard knocked against the wall. As if in response to the dog, dog barking in the distance. The crick-crick of tires in the street and the purr of engine reached throughout Mike's closed window. Mike looked at his pillow. All he wanted to do was flop down and put his face in it. Maybe like a human ostrich and block out the day, but he couldn't sleep yet. Raising his butt off the bed, half standing, Mike reached under his mattress and grabbed the pill bottle. Wrapping his finger around the hard, smooth plastic, he closed his eyes, savored the momentary relief he always felt when he started his nighttime routine. Mike opened his, opened the bottle's childproof cap and pulled out one of the small white pills. Immediately popping a pill in his mouth, he reached for the glass of water he put on his nightstand. He took a few sips of water, washing down the pill. Finally, Mike can put this day behind him. Looking forward, Mike pushed play on the cassette player. Immediately, his bedroom was filled with peaceful forest sounds. Mike closed his eyes and focused on the sprightly chirps of birds the cracks and snaps of branches being rustled by the wind. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Then he lay down flat on his bed. Opening his eyes, Mike looked straight up above his head, his bed, seeing past the images of the day that flicked through his mind like a hersky jerky slideshow. Mike focused on the poster taped in the ceiling. Pining for fun, the poster's head ring. Visit Nebraska. The words popped from the paper of the bright yellow blocking block letter font parading across the top of the saggy cluster of pine trees. As Mike gazed at the trees, the slideshow in his head continued. He saw an ugly brick government building, a social worker, uneven skirt, and the paper number 27. He saw Ragnall's smug face. He saw a series of help wanted signs and a matching series of head shakes as he was told he wasn't right for the job. He saw Max Big's eyes and Abby's dark ones. He saw the lead the red delinquency notice and the lasagna he ended up throwing away because he microwaved it too long and because Abby never came out to room to eat, brief. He told himself, zero in on the sounds of babbling brooks that came from his cassette player. He squinted on the pine trees, putting all his attention on his ritual so he could let the rest of the day fade away. 
Briefly, Mike remembered the first night he put up the poster. It had seemed like a stupid idea, but he was desperate. That night, it had taken forever for the cassette sounds and poster image to work their magic. Now, though, the effect was almost immediate. In a matter of seconds, Mike's mind lets go of the day. Impressions. His caution is slipped. His consciousness slipped into the pine tree scene, and the forest sounds grew clear, more and more realistic. Mike's gaze was full on commitment now. He was honed in. The forest was no longer a picture of the poster. The trees weren't frozen in the photo. They were moving. The sounds didn't come from the cassette. They came from real force. The wind that Mike could hear was swaying in the trees in a gentle back and forth room. Mike's eyelids began to flutter. Then he felt them droop lower and lower, close. But the trees didn't disappear. A gentle breeze caressed the heavy branches of the cluster of pine trees. The branches slimming back and forth in what almost looked like a coruscant dance. In front of the trees, a beam of sunshine slant onward the bright green wild grass. The light catches moisture on the tip of the grass blades, making them sparkle. Above the grass, caught in the sun's brilliant illumination, an orange toy plane arcs through the air. The little boy's hand grip at the body of the plane. The little boy looks about four years old. The boy had tousled black hair and a bow lip, bow like lip. Garrett, a woman's voice call out, "Stay close." Garrett and his airplane whip past the picnic table and disappear from view as the red spray of ketchup spread over the burger of the paper plate lying on the table. A smiling, dark-haired man who looks like an adult version of little Garrett walks past the picnic table. The man, carrying a couple of sleeping bags, laughs and calls out. How about some burgers with that ketchup, hun? Mike, twelve years old and all about having fun, grins at his mom. He looks at the ketchup bottle in his hand and winks at Mike. Everything's better swimming in ketchup, right, Mike? Right. Mike reaches his soda and accidentally knocks over the bottle of the twunk. The soda fizzing escape from the bottle is sprayed across the table. The frowning brownish liquid sounds like it's hissing into the pool of the woods. Oops, Mike's mom said. She turns away from the table. I'm going to go grab a towel. Keep an eye on your brother. Mike starts to turn towards Garrett, but as soon as he does the edge of the frisbee nearby gaze at Mike's gaze as it whisked past. Mike instantly jumps up and jogs away from the picnic table and retrieves the bright blue disc, which has landed on the edge of his family capsite. Mike reached the frisbee in seconds, and he bent over to pick it up. As his hands closed over the plastic rim of the disc, Mike hears the sound of a car engine revening. Mike straightens and looks around. He doesn't see the car, but there was something else more important that he doesn't see. Garrett? Mike calls. Garrett was nowhere in sight. Frisbee dangling from his hand, Mike starts walking towards the far side of the campsite. His pace was casual at first, and his brother's continuing absence filled him with urgency. Mike starts trotting towards the tree on the line of the little road that lands on the site. Garrett, Mike calls out. Mike hears the crackling, ping sounds of tires turning over gravel. Through the trees, he sees the hulking shape of a black car as it peels away from the campgrounds. Mike breaks out into a full-out run. Garrett, Mike shouts, "Is thrilling precinct. Mike is in the trees now." The long pine needles poke at his face. The branches slap at him. It feels like they were trying to grab him. Fallen twigs and pine cones crackle under Mike's feet. His nostrils were filled with the sharp smell of pine resign and the moist scene of the ground soft soil. Mike burst out of the trees just in time to see the black car picked up speed. The car was about 50 feet past Mike. It's zooming away. Mike, panting hard, looks towards the back of the car. His heart feels like it was being twisted in the chest as he looks at the car's rear window. Garrett! Mike gasped. Garrett's pale, wide eye face looks like back at Mike through the window, clutching his orange airplane. Garrett puts the put a hand on the glass. Garrett's eyes were filled with tears. His mouth was wide open, calling out. Mike opened his mouth too. He starts to let out a scream. The beep, beep, beep of Mike's alarm felt like a lasso that clinged up to, around him and yanked him out of sleep. Pulling a face, Mike reached out for his alarm. Today, his palm managed to find the top of the alarm. As soon as the beeping stopped, Mike's Moobly went through his morning routine. Cassette player off, rewind, pills under the mattress, push-ups. Mike's head didn't hurt as much this morning, but that didn't mean he felt any better. He wouldn't feel better until he could fix things. And after 13 years of trying, he started to think that that would never happen.